So we're going to continue with the book of Micah in chapter 2. And uh, if you recall in the apostasy series, I did a lot of sermon jams about some ministers. And today I'd like to play us a sermon jam from a pastor called Carter Conlon. Now Carter Conlon, he was mentored by David Wilkerson. He was at the Times Square Church in New York, New York. And God gave a vision to David Wilkerson about the coming disaster that was coming to New York six months before 9-11. It is one of the most incredible testimonies of God's faithfulness in the face of adversity, in the face of calamity, he prepared a church. And the testimonies that came out of this and on the Sunday, uh, you know, uh, the doors were open, they welcomed the people, they welcomed the firemen, they, they were prepared, they were ready for the disaster that came upon New York. And the Sunday following 9-11, Carter Conlon gave this sermon. And this is just an excerpt from it. A truly anointed sermon. Listen to me like you've never listened to me, ever in your life. We have got to lay our lives down for the purposes of God. This is not a Sunday school picnic, the Church of Jesus Christ. This is not an invitation to have continuous good times. This is a war for the souls of men. Come out from among them. Run for your life. Because this is about your life. It's not just about an opposing theology or conflicting viewpoint on Jesus. This is about your life. My mind is forever branded with the story that I heard of police officers from the city of New York as, as people were fleeing from a crumbling building. There were police officers and firemen and others that were running towards the building saying, run for your life at their own peril. And in some cases, I believe they knew they were going to die, but there was a sense of duty. I was crying out to God. I said, God, oh, Jesus, don't let my sense of duty be less for your kingdom than these beloved firemen and policemen were for those that are perishing in a falling tower. We're living in a generation when truth is falling into the streets. I want to be among those that are not running away from the conflict, but running into the conflict and say, run for your life. Run from Gospels that focus only on success and prosperity. Run! Run from those who use the name of Christ only for his personal gain. Run from those that are picking your pocket in the name of Jesus. Run! Run from Gospels that only focus on self-improvement. Run! Run from churches where men and not Christ are glorified. Run! Run! Body of Christ, run! Get out! Don't touch the unclean thing. Run from churches in America and Canada where there is no Bible. There's no cross in the theology. There's no soul-searching word. There's no repentance from sin. There's no mention of the blood of Jesus. Run! It's unclean! Run! Run from churches where you're comfortable in your sins. If you come into the house of God and you've got sin in your life and you're not convicted of it, you're at a table of devils. Run from pulpits that are filled with political men who are using the pulpit of God for a personal political agenda. Run! Run from those who preach division between races and cultures. Run! Run! Get out! Turn it off! Get away from it! 
They know nothing of God. Run from ungodly, spasmodic movements and endless, empty prophesying. Beloved church, run for your life. Run from preachers that stand and tell stories and jokes. Run like you've never run before. Run! 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 Oh, Heavenly Father, we surrender our lives to you, Lord. We offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to you, Lord, as we are in a battle and a war for not only our souls, but the souls of humanity, Lord. The soul of your church and your people, Lord. Heavenly Father, I pray that you open our ears, you open our hearts to receive this message this day, Lord. And let your Holy Spirit increase a hunger for your word and your truth in us, Lord. And that you give us the supernatural strength to endure what is coming on the horizon, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that there is no mystery for your people in your kingdom, Lord. And Lord, this is a time of separation. This is a time of sifting, Lord, where your true bride will separate from the false and the sheep and the goats will be separated. The wolves in sheep clothing will no longer stand in the presence of a holy remnant of God. So, Heavenly Father, we just give this time to you. And I pray, Lord, that your message will resonate so deep within each of us this day. We give you all the glory for who you are and your faithfulness, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Very, 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 I mean, those words were 19 years ago. That sermon was preached, and I would encourage you to go and look for it. Carter Conlon's message after 9-11. It's an incredible sermon. But we, we are in a situation now where, where many, many things are fluid, many things are changing. And so the Lord laid the book of Micah on my heart to deliver to you in this time. And so we continue. The Holy Remnant, a tale of two priests, priesthoods. So this is session number two, Micah chapter two. Woe to the oppressors is the title. Have you ever noticed in the scripture there's what's called the law of love. The love of God that is woven throughout the tapestry of Scripture and the covenants that God makes with the people that He loves and how people keep the covenant of God because they love Him. The recipro reciprocity of love. He loved us first before we even knew His name and yet we love Him for what He and His faithfulness do for us. And we're going to start on this, is to love God so wholeheartedly that we will live in accordance with God's revealed will for our lives as it is outlined in His written word. That this love is totally given over to and we demonstrate our love for God by our obedience. Love and obedience. Love leads to obedience. Without obedience, we cannot demonstrate love. Because the love of God has two sides. It has the grace and the mercy, but on the other side is the discipline of God. Because the severity of God is that God chases His children He loves. It has two sides. And that brings obedience to His Word. And these spiritual principles are laid out and the consequences thereof were laid out by Moses 
in the book of Deuteronomy from chapters 28 to 30. Paul lays this out in Romans chapter 10 and Jesus in John chapter 3. The obedience to God's word and the blessings of obedience and the curses of disobedience. There are two sides, just as there are two priesthoods. So we're going to get into what this separation is today. And we cannot claim the promises of God if we are not obedient to God's way and His truth. So it's time for us as the church to heed the warning. God is giving us a breather to prepare ourselves. And the book of Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29 to 31 demonstrates this. And it says, how much more severe a punishment do you think that person deserves who tramples on God's Son and treats as the blood, as common, the blood of the covenant by which it, is, it was sanctified and insults the Spirit of grace. For we know the one who said, Vengeance belongs to me. I will pay them back. And again, the Lord will judge His people. This is a warning to His people, His church. It's not against the wicked and those who are lost. This is a warning to His people. And here is this verse. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. How terrible it will be. And this is a warning to the people of God, the church, the bride of Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at Isaiah, and we're going to look at, in Isaiah chapter 5, what is known as the six woes of Isaiah. And the woe against materialism and covetousness. In Isaiah chapter 5 verse 8 and 10 it says, Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place, that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. And in mine ears, said the Lord of hosts, of a truth, many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair, without inhabitant. Yea, ten acres of a vineyard shall yield one bath, and the seed of a homer shall yield an, yield an ephah. How terrible it will be. Whoa. God warns His people. He warns us so that we can be ready and prepared. So that we will not react out of fear, but that we will demonstrate our faith. Because He is strengthening our faith. And here is the word to those who set their hearts upon the wealth of the world and place their happiness in that and increase it to themselves by indirect and unlawful means. It's never enough. Have you ever noticed the pursuit of materialism or worldly things that's never enough? You have and you just want more. And, he, and, and, and it's so amazing how... That, that verse in the book of John says, For the love of money is the root of all evil. The pursuit of money, the pursuit of material things, what it does to the human heart, what it does to people's characteristics. And the second woe is the woe against sensual carnality. It says, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflames them. And the harp and the vial, the tablet and the pipe and wine are all in their feasts. But they regard not the work of the Lord. Neither consider the operation of His hands. And therefore, my people, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. And their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. These woes are to the people of God, or the people who call themselves by the name of the Lord. 
Isaiah was a prophet to the southern kingdom. He was a contemporary of Micah. Micah, this book, is actually called the mini Isaiah. And Isaiah quotes Micah as well. And so these woes, it says, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he that rejoices shall descend into it, and the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and, the, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. God has a purpose for bringing judgment because it brings His people back into obedience and into the restored relationship with Him. And this is what the shaking is about. And so the third woe is against the cords of sin. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin as it were with the cart rope. They openly parade their stubbornness, their rebellion, their sin, in defiance of what God says. And, he, and that say, let him make speed. And here they are mocking God. Say, let him make speed and hasten his work so that we may see it. And let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it. They're challenging God. They're mocking Him. They, 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 they're almost throwing it back in His face by their behavior. Because there's no repentance. There's no holiness in the house of God. There's no fear of the Lord in the house of God. And this word called, or Hebel, is it's a cord, a rope, a territory, a band, or a company. But what it also means is pain, sorrow, travail, and pains. The travail of a woman, the birth pains that is so evident that is around us. You know, once that baby enters into the birth canal, there is no stopping it. There is no turning back. So I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that tomorrow everything is going to be okay. What I am going to tell you is what the Lord warns His people about. So that we can be awake and aware with what is coming. And that know that God will provide for us. Because we are obedient to His will. Because we are obedient to His word. And this is a noose for those in defiance of God's way and truth. So if you're going to defy God, this is the noose that is coming. And the fourth word is against confounding or confusing right and wrong. We live in an age of truth relativism. He says, woe well, unto you, unto them that call evil good, and good evil, and that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, and put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Everything is turned upside down. It's backwards. So the minimizing of truthfulness corrupts others so that the entire government or body becomes corrupt. And our systems are corrupt and no longer value God's truth. When a nation turns its back on the principles of God, when a church neglects her duty as the priests of God, and do not stand up for what is right in God's will. And go and, and give their authority away to the, the leaders of that nation. This is what happens. We give up our rights. We give up the authority that Jesus Christ has given His church. It's time to speak up and stand up for the truth. God says, honor me amongst men and I will honor you in heaven. It's like Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, not to speak in the face of evil is, is giving power to the evil. It's evil itself. Not to act is to act. Not to speak is to speak. And this is this concept. And the, the fifth woe is against man's own wisdom, his own way. His woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. The foolishness of our own way 
and our own wisdom. Proverbs 19 verse 12, 21 says, There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord shall stand. What we need is righteous counsel. What we need is righteous men and women. Honorable men and women who will stand up for God's truth. And not feed off men's wisdom and lies. And the six woes against the intoxication of self-indulgence, which is idolatry. And so when the word is speaking about alcohol, it talks about the effects, the intoxication. Because what happens when you become inebriated, intoxicated and drunk? It's about the fruit of that. It's not the wine itself. It's what happens to you and what happens to your spiritual man and woman. What happens to your spirit and your heart. It says, woe unto them who are mighty to drink wine. The boastfulness and the arrogance and the men of strength to mingle strong drink which justify the wicked for reward. Everything is right in their eyes and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. And this is echoed in the book of Samuel, one of the most incredible verses, chapter 15 verse 23. It says, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord and he has also rejected thee from being king none of us sitting here want to hear those words from Jesus Christ on judgment day and he says I never knew you depart from me worker of iniquity worker of lawlessness we have a choice to restore and line our lives up and, and get into God's will. Because this justice that is happening, this shaking that is going on, is in accordance to God's plan. Because God has always, through the process of disciplining His people, preserved a remnant in every generation as a witness in every community throughout all of history this is God's faithfulness and he's after purity in our hearts but the Lord of hosts is exalted in justice this is the time we edify and exalt the Lord so yes this is the intro to chapter 2 but you'll see why it was so important to deal with these woes how terrible it will be Last week we looked at the sins against God. Chapter 2 looks at the sins against each other. Woe to them that devise iniquity. Micah chapter 2 verse 1. Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. And when the morning is light they practice it. Because it is in the power of their hand. They devise, they work, and they practice. This is the process. They do evil not merely on a sudden impulse, but with a deliberate design. There's a pattern here. They devise, there's the conception of an evil purpose. There's a work or a fabrication, which is the maturation of this evil scheme. And there's a practice or effect which is the execution of it. What we are seeing now has been planned. And it is being executed. And it's not going to make sense. Because this is what the Bible says in the book of Proverbs. It talks about the two women of, and the woman of wisdom and the woman of folly. So we are to follow the woman of wisdom. But this woman of folly, this harlot... The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, her ways are not knowable. It's changing. It's like a serpent slithering. This is what's going on, my brothers and sisters. And it is in the power of their hand. It is might, not right. This is what drives their conduct. It regulates their conduct. It's the thirst for power. 
They want more power. And where they can, they commit oppression and violence. But it is God who judges the earth. And in Psalm 58, verse 1 to 5, it says, Do ye indeed speak righteousness, O congregation? Do you judge uprightly? And O you sons of men, yea, in the heart you work wickedness, and weigh the violence in, the ha in your hands in the earth. And the wicked are estranged from the womb, and they go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. If somebody comes to you, this was the principle that the Lord laid down back in Deuteronomy and in the Exodus with Moses. If a prophet comes to you and he speaks a falsehood, he is to be taken outside of the camp and stoned. God hasn't changed his mind. There is no falsehood in, in the Lord. There's no falsehood in his word. Everything is truth. So we have to line up to his truth. And please, stop listening to the false prophets. None of them have repented. Have you seen any repentance of these TV celebrities? Their heart is still defiant. The only way is to get into the Word of God, to know the author of this book, to know Jesus, to know God, to know more of Him. And this is it. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. This is venom. We don't want the venom coming from the pulpits. We don't want the venom coming from our leaders and the politicians. Because this here, the poison of the serpent, this is the same word that is used for the Nachash, the serpent in the Genesis 3, in the Garden of Eden. Because this is the power that's behind it. And this is their method of deception. It says their poison is like the poison of a serpent. And they are like a deaf adder that stoppeth the ear. I'm saying it, but you're not hearing it. Listen. And which will not hark, and it says, which will not hearken to the voice of charmers. Charming never so wisely. This word nachash is tied up to this charming enchantment. The word is lachash. Because the Nakash is by the sound of his hissing, the illumined one. And the, the charming is through the fascination. You know, the snake charmer. That's where this all comes from. This is the spirit that is evident. So I'm praying that you will see it. Let you be able to recognize and discern the spirit behind these things. Because the word here, which is very interesting, when the scripture talks about violence, it's Hamas, which is by implication wrong, by unjust gain, cruelty, damage, false, injustice, oppressor, oppression and violence are tied together throughout the scripture, throughout the word of God. And unrighteousness and the violence against in their dealing with. So it's robbery and thievery. And so this is where we come to woe to them that covet and oppress. Micah chapter 2 verse 2. It says, and they covet fields and they take them by violence and houses and take them away so that they oppress a man and his house. And even a man and his heritage. This is so relevant for today. And the word oppression here is to oppress, defraud, to violate, to get deceitfully, to deceive and to drink up or use oppression and do violence. So the spirit that is behind the times that we are in today. And the Lord showed this so clearly. And I'm praying that you will hear this. This is covetousness. To covet. The word is chamad, which is to desire, to desire, 
to covet, to take pleasure in, and to delight in. Someone else's possessions, someone else's inheritance. And the word heritage is a possession, property, portion, inheritance. So if we belong to Jesus, do we desire and covet the things in this world? We are a purchased possession. Jesus paid the price in full by His blood and His covenant. It is not our, we no longer ours, it is not our right. We have given ourselves over to the Lord as His living sacrifice. And He has been the propitiation, He has paid the atonement for our sins. And our inheritance is to be found in Jesus Christ. And this is at the heart of this. There is a biblical reason prohibiting land grabbing, financial and financial slavery. This was not only the sin of coveting, but the land was considered one of God's gifts to His people. It is a gift from God. It is your inheritance from God. And also the practice of usury is expressly forbidden. The practice of usury is, is the method of taking interest on loans. It is expressly forbidden in the scriptures. It is against God's law. And it results in modern day slavery. These are the spirits and the forces that are working behind the systems that we live in today. And as the church, as the priests, we need to take a stand and not step aside in this time. Because if we step aside, we will not stand what is coming. The only way that we will stand is if Jesus holds our hands and He surrounds us with His angels. Because the thief comes to rob and destroy through deception, force and fraudulent means. He is a thief and, a and the father of lies is our adversary. And do not give your inheritance away for a loaf of bread. This is a strong message. But we need to know, if we know the root, we will know the fruit. We always have to look at what is the fruit of the circumstance or the situation. And so these people were increasing their wealth through force and fraud. And the root of this problem is that power is in the hands of the ungodly. And the abandonment of righteousness weakens the seat of any government and the stability and security of a nation. Because in Proverbs 16 verses 11 and 12 it says, A just weight and balance are the Lord's, and all the weights of the bag are His work. God is the one who has the scales. He measures each of us out. But it is an abomination to kings to commit wickedness, for the throne is established by righteousness. Without righteousness, there will not be righteous fruit. There will not be good fruit. And this is the principle. Because the abandonment of truth and loyalty to covenants undermines the leadership of any ruler. Whether it be in, in whatever, whether it be a corporation, whether it be in, in politics, whether it be within the church as well. Especially in the church. Because God raises up the kings, but He also raises up the priests and the prophets. The priests are supposed to keep the leaders accountable. And we don't. Not bow. I mean, like you see the South African Churches of Council. Did you see the South African Church Council of Churches this weekend? It's a disgrace. 
They, they allow the churches to be open, but yet then they say, no, sorry, we're not going to open. So they make a big fuss and they don't. So anyway, I don't want to get into that, but they are now raising solidarity for this guy who is this Black Lives Matter in America. You know what? All lives matter. God. We are all equal in God's eyes. There is no black or white or green or yellow in God's sight. We all have the DNA of Adam designed in the image and the likeness of God. There is no racism. There is no division. There is no cultural differences. We are all equal in God's eyes. Enough of these lies. The issue of bribery is at the root of this. It's the issue of corrupting the morals and acting on principle as opposed to being driven by self-greed and covetousness. Instead of having, having the moral compass and the moral principles, they give themselves over to the pursuit. And the, the fruit of their doings is this gathering in wealth. Every day we see new stories of corruption in the press. All across the world. No country is immune. Because when integrity is forsaken, justice is overthrown. There is no justice for the poor and the needy and the widows and the orphans. There is no justice because the integrity of God is forsaken. And this is Proverbs 29 verse 4. It says, The king by judgment establisheth the land, but he that receiveth gifts overthroweth it. Benefiting from your position of power is an abomination of God. And no matter what decree is issued, no matter what law is issued, if there is personal gain, not the gain of the people that you're supposed to be watching over you. You know the word in the, in the Greek when it talks about the elders of a church. The word means they are God's servant managers. The leaders are servant managers. Where is the heart of a servant? Where is the heart of, of a servant in our leadership? Not only in this nation, but globally. And the minimizing of truthfulness corrupts others so that the entire government becomes corrupt. And Proverbs 29 verse 12, it says, If a ruler hearken to lies, all his servants are wicked. It spreads like cancer. Because guess what? In Galatians 5 verse 9, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. It ruins the whole batch. And as a baker, I can tell you, there's no recovery from baking. If you have made a mistake and that bread is not rising, it will never rise. If you don't follow the recipe properly, if you don't follow the method of proving, proving it and baking it, it will be a flop. You will end up with a brick, not a loaf of bread. A little leaven levels the whole lump. And it is for us, here in this community, to not be partakers of the lies of the enemy. Amen. And to stand up on God's word. That is the rock upon which I stand. That is the rock upon which we stand. Because when the storms of life come, this house will not be shaken. And those whose lives are built upon the sand will fall. There is only one way to stand in this hour. Because what you sow, you will reap. Amen. In Micah chapter 2 verse 3, it says, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, against this family do I devise an evil from which ye shall not remove your necks, you shall not escape, and neither shall you go haughtily, for the time is evil. This is the consequence of disobedience, of not walking in the love of God, because the punishment will fit 
the crime. This is the spiritual principle. Because in Galatians 6 verse 7 and 8, these are incredible verses. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that he shall also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Powerful, powerful. There cannot be anything worse when the Lord disinherits His people. Because we have broken the covenant with Him. And the Lord, because He is righteous, because He is holy, has to establish Himself through His judgment. And here it is in Micah chapter 2 verse 4. And it says, In that day shall one take up a parable against you, and lament with a doleful lamentation, and say, We be utterly spoiled. He hath changed the portion of my people, and he hath how sorry, how hath he removed it from me? Turning away, he hath divided our fields. I mean, last week in chapter 1, you could see that the inheritance, so there was a, a foreign heir that came that was going to overtake the possessions. Now God is being specific. And this here, it's a howl of wailing, of lamentation for those who are led astray. And the Hebrew is actually a lament with the lamentation of laments. It's a play of words. It's like how terrible it will be. Because you have turned away from me, says God, I will turn away from you. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And this is the charge of injustice against others and rebellion against God. And he transfers to our possessions and rightful portion to the enemy. Just like Esau, he sold his birthright. He lost his inheritance for a bowl of soup. This is a judgment for apostasy, backsliding and disobedience. And this is a warning to us now as God's people because there's a cord of ruin that is coming for those who do not hear. In Micah 2 verse 5 it says, Therefore thou shalt have none shall cast a cord by lot in the congregation of the Lord. Their ruin will be so complete that when the time came for the land to be redistributed, there would be no one to represent them. And their place in the nation will be lost forever, is what this is saying here. Because this is the cord that binds you and your destiny. Listen to Isaiah's woes and warning as well as Micah. Jesus is the scarlet thread that weaves through and liberates us. It takes us out of bondage. Those chains are broken in His name, by His blood. But this is a cord that will bind you. It will chain you if you fall into this path. And the people are saying, prophesy not, they say. In Micah chapter 2 verse 6, says, prophesy ye not. They say to them that prophesy. And they shall not prophesy to them, so that they shall not take shame. Do not offend. Do not offend us. Do not be a rock of offense. If you are speaking the word of God, it is going to bring an offense. No matter what. As I said last week, the word of God will either break you or it will harden you. So what they try and do is they silence the messenger. And they forget the message. This is the ploy of the enemy. Prophesy not against us. We don't want to be ashamed. Don't expose us. Because here it is in Isaiah 30 verses 9 to 11. It says that this is a rebellious people, lying children, 
and children that will not hear the law of the Lord and would say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Get out of the way and turn aside out of the path and cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Be careful of those that lead you astray with promises of self-improvement, with promises of prosperity. Because it is only in the fire of God that God can purge us. He can cleanse us. There is only one way to become refined. There is only one way to grow. When God has to take us out of our comfortable situations. It's time to be uncomfortable in the presence of God. Of a holy God. Let Him work deep inside your lives. So that you may be able to stand upon this rock. There is only one way. Because the truth of God will always arise opposition. And the religious leaders at the time always they spoke up to defend their rulers. And the rich influential men and women and denounce God's spokesmen. This is the pattern that we see. All of these organizations and these Christian groups in support of wickedness. Do not hide behind Romans 13 and expect, because really Romans 13 is about leaders that God raises to lead His people in righteousness. Amen. Not in falsehood and lies. Because if you follow that path, you are going to the pit of hell. That is what the Bible says. If you follow that wide gate, you are not going to enter into His kingdom. For narrow is the way, constricted is the path, that you will enter into His kingdom. Narrow is the gate. In name only, in Micah chapter 2 verse 7 and 8, this is the people of God saying, Oh, thou art named the house of Jacob. And is the Spirit of the Lord straightened? Are these His doings? And do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly? And oh, even of late my people is risen up as an enemy. This is God. His people have become his enemy. It says, pull ye off the robe with the garment from them that pass as securely as men adverse from war. There's no conflict. Don't conflict us. You know, we have the name of the house of Jacob. You can't touch us. In name only. And this reminds me of Jesus' warning to the church of Sardis. In the book of Revelation 3 verse 1 it says, I know thy works, and thou that, that thou hast a name, that thou livest. Yet thou art dead. It's not about our name only. It's about knowing the author of these books. Knowing Jesus. And not only when someone asks you the question, do you know Jesus? It also should be, does he know you? Amen. Both ways. And there's also this warning that is echoed in the church to Laodicea. This same pattern. It says, I know your works, that you are neither cold or hot, that I would rather you were cold or hot. I'd rather you took a stance. That more respect you. Yes. <laughs> Take a stand. So because you are lukewarm, and you are neither hot nor cold, you're not taking an opinion, I will vomit you out of my mouth. And God couldn't put it in his tongue. No. This is the words of Jesus himself. So it's time to either get cold and walk away or be on fire for God. Don't sit on the fence any longer. 
And you can read this later, Isaiah chapter 59. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But, he has a big but. Your iniquities have separated between you and God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear you. Read this chapter. We quote this verse that his hand is not shortened, that he cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that he cannot hear. Read the next verse. The people's predicament is because of their sin, because of their rebellion. And God has hid his face from his people. We don't want to be a church that God hides his face from and that doesn't hear our cries. It's a polluted system of priests and leaders. In Micah chapter 2 verse 9 to 11, this is the consequence of this. The women of my people have ye cast out from their pleasant houses and from their children ye have taken away from my glory forever. Children are the inheritance of the parents, of the generations. And when God says, I'm going to take your children away into captivity, into exile, because this is exactly what happened. And this is what will happen in this time. And he says, arise ye and depart, for this is not your rest. Because it is polluted, it shall destroy you even with a sore destruction. And if a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink, thou shalt even be the prophet of this people. They'll rather accept the smooth things, accept the intoxication of idolatry, of self carnality and indulgence. This intoxication and pollution of the people of God will result in no inheritance and lead to destruction. What God is saying here, there is no salvation here. If this is the path that you are on, get out and get out of it and, and run for your life. And it's happening in our churches today. Yes. It's happening in the churches as we speak. In these wealth for these wealth preachers and yes we see this is this resonating with you the word of god gives us a warning and it talks about the fables and the falsehood of false priests so when men turn a deaf ear to the word and the revelation of god they turn to downright fables in jeremiah 5 verse 31 it says the prophets prophesy falsely and the priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to have it so. They love it. They want it this way. And Ezekiel in 13 verse 3, it says, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. And this is echoed in Isaiah as well. Chapter 9, verse 7 to 9. The days of visitation have come, the day of recompense are come, and Israel shall know it. The prophet is a fool, and the spiritual man is mad. For the multitude of thine iniquity and the great hatred, and the watchman of Ephraim was with my God, but a prophet is a snare of a fowler in all of his ways and the hatred in the house of God, and they have deeply corrupted themselves. Therefore, he will remember their iniquity and he will visit their sins. God is visiting the sins of every nation. The punishment will fit the crime according to their deeds. What has been sown spiritually, this will be the spiritual harvest. This will be the harvest. We are engaged in an unseen war for the souls of men and women. Amen. That is the real problem. This is the cancer. This is the disease. 
And the church has the only answer. But yet, I see they are falling by the wayside. So God, make us strong. Strengthen us and bring us closer to you. Because there is always a hope for the hopeless. No matter how absolute the message of judgment, the prophets always conclude with the promise of restoration and hope. God already has a way out for you. A means of escape. Jesus, our good shepherd, he is the only way. And God has a remnant, a holy remnant, set apart and preserved for him alone. And this remnant will escape. In Micah chapter 2 verse 12, it says, I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel, and I will put them together as the sheep of Bozrah. And as the flock in the midst of their fold, and they shall make a great noise by the reason of the multitude of men. This word Bosra is a sheepfold or enclosure. It's a walled or fenced enclosure with a narrow entrance. Jesus is the door to his sheep. He is the door. In John chapter 10, I encourage you to read this. He says, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door to the sheep, and all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. And I am the door, and by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and he shall go in and out and find pasture. Because the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy and I am come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. For I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And here is the warning. This is the false shepherd. And this, what you're seeing now, they are setting up for the coming up of the Antichrist and the false world leader. He is the hireling. This is referring to him, the false shepherd, the idol shepherd. It says, he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, who sh who, whose own the sheep are not. See the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. Because the hireling fleeth, because he is a hireling, and care not for the sheep. Because I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and have known of mine. The hireling, how many hirelings are there in the pulpits of the church that are not standing up and feeding the sheep of God and feeding the people of God? What is the last words that Jesus says in John 21 to his disciples when they're fishing all night and they can't catch the fish and Jesus tells them to take the net and throw it on the other side and then they, they come and Jesus makes the fish for them and Jesus asks this question to Peter three times. He says, do you love me? And Peter answers, yes, I do. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Because the breaker is coming. The breaker is coming. In Micah 2 verse 13, it says, the breaker is come and up before them. And they have broken up and have passed through the gate and have gone out by it. And their king shall pass before them and the Lord is the head of them. This is a title of Jesus Christ. Breakthrough is coming for his people. He is the breaker. So line up behind him, behind his will and into his presence. And he will lead every single one of you and your families out of this take your glory lord we thank you for who you are father god thank you for this message lord lord let this message penetrate deep into our hearts and our spirits lord and let us meditate on these things and thank you lord that you have warned us of these events that you show us through the patterns of history that everything is according to your story, Lord. 
that, Lord, these things are not strange that are happening around us. But, Lord, you reveal the spirit that is behind this calamity. And the reason for it, it's because your people, your spiritual compass in the, in the nation has lost their way. So, Lord, bring us back. Restore us. Lead us back into a right relationship with you, Lord. Without you, we cannot stand. Without our house being built upon your rock, we cannot stand. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you will be that Basra, that, that wall, the enclosed encampment around your people, and that you are the one that stands guard at the door. And you are the one that protects us. You are the one that surrounds us. We are, and we are within the sanctuary of your protection, Lord. As you wall your people about, you hedge them about. This is that concept, Lord, to be hedged about by a, what, a ring of thorns, by a walled fortress, because we are your sheepfold and we are in your will and under your protection and no harm shall come to us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.